Great. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this event that IID is putting on as part of London Climate Action Week. We're very pleased that you're able to join us. We've got a really interesting presentation of some research that we've been doing um, with Primark on some of their cotton supply chain, and then a great panel uh, to discuss the potential role of insurance in helping to address climate adaptation and resilience. And for those of you who aren't in London this week, it's London Climate Action Week. And there's been a lot of events, uh, including a really great one that I went to yesterday, um, bringing together people interested in gender, climate and insurance and looking at how particularly uh, insurance at every level, at the local level, more globally, um, can support issues of um climate resilience for, for women. We've got, a, as I said, a really great panel, so I don't want to spend too much time setting the context, but just to give you a little bit of the background to this work, um, we were talking to Primark as, as a company with a, a strong focus on um, a better cotton um, supply chain, and they work with a lot of um, women farmers in southern India and work with a partner organisation, Sewa. And through their discussions, they were seeing that women were experiencing much more crop um, yield variability because of changing climate, droughts and, uh, and floods what, what was having an ongoing effect. And that was really um, nogging back their resilience. So what are some of the tools that could potentially be used? Now, insurance is potentially a great tool, but there's also a challenge of how the premiums get paid or how the payoffs happen. And are is it in a way that's sort of timely and, and really helps producers? So we undertook some research with uh, with Sewa, uh, with a local research partner, AIDMI, and with the insurance broker, KM Dastur. And we're going to hear first uh, from my colleague, Emma Blackmore, about some of that work. And then we're going to widen it up um, in the context of the sort of London Climate Action Week and these bigger global discussions uh, about these issues. So I'm going to pass on now to Emma to start her presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura, for the introduction. Alejandro, are you OK to share your screen so we can see the PowerPoint? And I should just add, while Alejandro is doing that, that this was very much a team team effort, the piece of research that we're going to present today. So I collaborated with um, other colleagues within IID, so Alejandro, Julia and Jose, um, but also central to this research with the partners that we worked with um, to carry out the research in the field. So that is AI, DMI, KM Duster and, and Sewa, who are absolutely central to, to doing the research. Next slide, please, Alejandro. So um, this piece of research was looking at the vulnerabilities of small scale farmers, um, cotton farmers in India to climate change and what kind of coping strategies um, they employ. Um, our main objective was um, to gather evidence for improved and more impactful decision making by Primark and Sewa and also the broader cotton industry. And we sought to do this through better understanding of the needs and challenges of small scale farmers. And we did this through the primary research that I'm going to be presenting today. And this was based on a survey of farmers and focus group discussions. And I'll tell you a bit more about the approach in a minute. But we also sought to understand what broader lessons can be learned around best practices in crop insurance for small scale farmers. And that was based very much on a literature review that will be available um, in the coming weeks. And I won't be presenting the findings from that today. I'll be focusing on the primary research. Um, and overall to develop recommendations for how we can improve the resilience of small scale farmers um, and how we can enhance access to crop insurance where that is a useful tool. Next slide, please. So what was our research approach? Um, we undertook a survey of farmer households in Gujarat and Maharashtra, which are obviously key cotton producing regions and very important um, areas of supply of cotton for Primark. Field work was conducted by AI DMI, who I mentioned earlier, um, in September of last year. Um, we interviewed 360 households in total, which can be considered uh, a representative sample. So it's statistically significant if you do testing on it, but it also um, can be considered representative of, of what happens in the majority of, of households in those particular areas. Um, so it was 180 in each state split across two blocks. The sampling was random and stratified. Uh, we had half SEWA members and half non-SEWA members to see if there was any difference in resilience between those groups. 
Um, all of our respondents were women, which very much reflected the fact that SEWA is a, a women's based organization. Um, only 4% of those described themselves as the main or sole earners in the household. So most of these belonged to male headed households. And we also conducted focus group discussions in Gujarat in November 2023, and the IIT, IIB team were present for those FTDs. Um, and it really helped us kind of understand some of the nuances behind the survey data. Next slide, please. Alejandro, I can't tell if I've frozen. Oh, there we are. So um, some of the earlier questions we asked in the survey was trying to understand what sort of shocks, um, climate related shocks farmers are subjected to. What they consistently report is that they're receiving less rain, it's less predictable um, and there's less of it, that there are longer dry spells um, and more frequent heat waves. Um, and you can see in the graphs there, um, what, what kind of erratic rainfall and heat waves, how often they think that those are happening um, with erratic heat waves, with erratic rainfall and heat waves um, happening um, every one to two, one to three years. Next slide, please. And what this leads to is significant cross lot, crop loss. So here they linked crop loss to different extreme events and reported um, how much of their crop they actually lost. And half of the respondents reported major or complete crop losses as a result of drought and flooding. Next slide, please. Farmers are most vulnerable to these shocks in April to August when they have the lowest um, months of income. Next slide, please. And the measures that they um, take to cope with those shocks, um, the most popular or the most commonly reported was using savings, um, reducing their expenditures and taking loans. But they also use multiple on-farm um, mitigation strategies as well as economic mitigation strategies. So the on-farm strategies that they take to try and build their resilience and cope with shocks is crop rotation, as well as intercropping, planting more trees and diversifying their crops. And then in terms of economic mitigation measures, they attempt to increase savings in the bank, which can be challenging. Some purchase crop insurance, some try to reduce their debt, some purchase health insurance, and some try to work off farm. Next slide, please. Um, the use of in insurance we found, um, specifically crop insurance, is relatively infrequent despite farmers claiming that they have an interest in, in gaining insurance and in, in signing up to insurance. So here we asked them about what current insurance they have, and this included both government and private schemes. And in India, as we'll, we'll hear later from KM Duster, there are a number of government schemes on offer. Um, so here we can see um, there's a difference between the state, which is quite interesting, but we have about 60% of farmers who claim that they're signed up to a crop insurance scheme, for example, um, slightly higher rates in Maharashtra than Gujarat. Um, lower levels of um, insurance for livestock, health and life. Um, but 57% of farmers said they would be interested in joining a scheme. So there is some demand there. Next slide, please. So what are the main barriers to um, insurance? We found that these were lack of awareness of local schemes. So farmers said they didn't really know of any schemes available where they were, and also that they were unaffordable. So what were perceived as kind of high levels of premium were seen as a key barrier. And those are consistent, more or less consistent across the different um, different insurance types. But particularly crop insurance and health, um, there is this kind of lack of awareness of, of schemes in the area that the farmers are in. Next slide, please. Brilliant. Um, so there is uneven knowledge and coverage of government insurance schemes in particular. Um, so here we have the PMFBY, which is available in some states. Um, in Maharashtra, for example, that is still in existence, but there is now a different version of the scheme in Gujarat. Um, but there are you know, a relatively high number of farmers, around 65%, who are aware of those government schemes. Um, but you know, just under half who are actually signed up to those schemes for various reasons. 
And then the other insurance schemes that you see there are related to health and life insurance. And um, I think asset insurance is one of them as well. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we had a number of focus group discussions um, to kind of expand on the, the data that we were finding in the surveys, which was really, really helpful. And, and what we found was that there is, there is confusion about what's available in terms of insurance and specifically crop insurance and what exactly is covered. And this is even amongst those farmers who have signed up to the government scheme. So are they going to be compensated for when they lose their crops or are they going to be compensated for the loans that they took out and just up to the value of the loan? And also who's providing the insurance was often unclear to, to the farmers that we spoke to. Farmers complained that um, there were burdensome and lengthy processes both to sign up, but also to make claims where they had experienced losses, lots of paperwork and transactions, which um, you know, they felt unable to, to complete. And, and they also lacked confidence that they would actually be compensated fairly when they experienced a crop loss. So um, quite a number of people mentioned that the weather stations weren't close enough to them or weren't accurate um, in kind of capturing loss or triggering index insurance, for example. Next slide, please. So finally, just some very kind of top level recommendations here coming out of that primary research. Um, there is some need to improve awareness among small scale farmers of coping mechanisms available. And obviously insurance is one of those, particularly the government schemes. There doesn't seem to be clarity on, on how those operate, um, how to make a claim, for example. There's definitely scope to co-design new ideas for insurance products that really focus on making insurance affordable and effective for small scale farmers who have kind of lim limited um, purchasing power. Um, but we should also be thinking beyond insurance. So there are lots of other approaches that can build and strategies that can build resilience among small scale farmers. And Sewa has a really nice example of a, of a livelihood and recovery fund that they and their members invest in that are helping farmers cope with climate related shocks. And we should also be thinking beyond Primark and beyond India so which sectoral approaches might work to build resilience? Which other partners and stakeholders can we work with? Um, and what does the broader landscape of climate resilience look like? And how can we work together um, to, to build resilience amongst small scale farmers um, growing cotton, but also other crops? Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. And impeccably timed too. Great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Great. Um, so my name is Alejandro Guarín. I'm a researcher at IID, and I I lead our food systems work. And I've been I've been working on this project with Emma, um, with Laura, with our colleagues in AIDMI and Sewan. I'm very pleased to introduce a really great panel, who's gonna give us it's gonna take us a bit deeper into some of these issues and also give us a flavor of what these issues look like from very different perspectives and hopefully will come up, uh, it'll add up to something quite interesting and and significant by putting all these different perspectives together. So first I'm gonna call, <clears throat> sorry, first I'm gonna call um, um, Rajvi Yoshipura, who is at the Self-Employed Women's Association of India, Sewa, we're very happy to have you here. Rajvi Ben, I'm not sure if you're there with Hina Ben or not, but I'll so I'll, so 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 Rajvi is with with Hina Ben Dave, the vice president of Sewa, um, and over to you to tell us a little bit what what those challenges from the farmers look like uh, and what you're doing to support them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, greetings and namaste to everyone. Dr. Rajvi Joshipura and I've been associated with the organization for past four, four and a half years. And I mean, so with recent climate shocks, so I would first like to highlight that SEWA is a trade union of 2.9 million women workers. And the key question that most of the time we all face or hear is why does a farmer remain hungry? And because most of the rural members, whenever we interact with them, they'll tell us that what we grow or what we produce in the market is not we eat. So here itself, we see the gap and the reasons for which are as follows, that their income is marginal and irregular. Second, 
But the tools that they use are old, worn out. They don't have access to newer technology. And reasons to it are varied. Be it their access to low-cost finance or majority of the farmers that are working as agricultural laborers. They are unregistered, which leaves them outside the purview of various government schemes. Last is limited access to changing market and economic trends. And recently, all have been observing that climate shocks are increasing at an escalating rate. So it impacts the farmers, the marginal workers to a great extent. If, uh, if I have permission, I would like to share a short video, which is a one and a half minute video, and it will highlight what members go through. Is that okay? Go for it, yeah. Yeah, so that was the video which showed us that what are the impacts climate shocks have. So out of the 2.9 million members that SEVA organizes, about uh, two-third members belong to rural regions. And from them, agriculture is their main occupation. And 54% of them are small marginal farmers. So what happens is that women workers in these informal economy, as we discussed earlier, are excluded from labor law, social security measures. And towards the end of the day, what happens is their livelihoods get impacted, their health gets impacted, and their out-of-pocket expenditure increases. So having the largest membership from the agriculture sector, Seva initiated an agriculture campaign in 1995 to address the pressing issue that why does the farmer remain hungry? And through this, what it aims is to empower these small marginal farmers by providing them with training, education and awareness, market access and linkage to financial services to improve their livelihoods and transition and make them more equitable and have them access sustainable agricultural sectors. So 
what happens is that as we said that climate shocks impact multiple aspects of their lives. So during one of the focus groups, the members said like one of the soil fan worker and the farmer, a group of farmers, they mentioned that the climate shocks like floods or heat waves might just occur for a period of two to three days at a stretch. But what happens is that they leave a trail of impact behind them, which is long lasting. And it impacts not only their income for the present season, but also for following several months to come. Their savings get drained and very often they are no, they are left with no option and have but to wait for correct time. So they don't want charity, but what they want is a helping hand, which can provide them with work that is productive, sustainable and ensures dignity. So keeping all this in mind, Seema took up the Swachh Akash campaign, that is the Clear Sky campaign, and which aims towards advocating for climate justice at all levels because as Seema members believe that clean sky, green environment is not only a fundamental right, but is a fundamental right for everyone across all economic sections. So, as a part of Swachh Akash campaign, we aim to build the economy of nurturance with a following four sets of interventions. The first of them is green village slash wands. So it includes accelerating access to green transition and tapping into carbon markets using various solutions. It excess education awareness. Subsequently, it will be followed by research and knowledge, which will have main focus on collecting data. And the last is innovative climate financing, which will be our main focus for Today, so as a part of innovative climate financing, what SEMA piloted has been piloting for past two years is, is the extreme heat income micro insurance. So Raji, what happens then I'm is, gonna ask you to, to wrap up quite soon. Is that okay? Yeah, it'll be done two minutes. So as you can see on the screen, what happened was that the product was structured keeping in mind maximum daytime temperatures. And the payout, it would pay out multiple times the amount would have been directly credited into their accounts. So the lessons learned were that it provided members with financial security, financial inclusion, improved livelihoods. And going down the lane, what SEMA plans to do is have multiple parameters in place, account for micro environment temperatures and link them to other savings programs. And the second one was livelihood resilience and recovery fund. So what it aims to do is it provides immediate support to members in terms of climate shocks through first loss default guarantee, interest subvention, debt service maintenance, and credit guarantees. So in past, SEMA systems have shown exemplary track, track records. And the reason for us having this is that very often members are considered to be unbankable. So the NRIF product helps SEMA cover up for members with immediate assistance. Great. Thank you, Rajvi. That was very, very helpful. Um, I'm passing it on to Vishal Patak, who's the coordinator at the All India Disaster Mitigation Institute. And Vishal, by give us a bit of a broader kind of context of what's going on in India with, with climate risk and and what is what is what is the the the, the picture, the bigger picture here. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Alandro. Hope you're getting my voice and screen. We can. Great. Thank you. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm going to share, as uh, said, a uh, key aspect from the India. And, you know, major point is about the cotton yield in India is much lesser than the key producing, cotton producing countries. And uh, one of main reason is also about uh, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers uh, and we believe and we also witness and of course seva is playing crucial role which directly with the women farmers that uh, participation of women is uh, crucial uh, because in their day-to-day -day life women plays a very important role as a you know environment friendly more than the other 
Uh, another one thing is in terms of vulnerability, co-location of hazard is, you know, uh, really uh, creating uh, big uh, challenges. Uh, uh, in recent years, in within the one year, farmers are facing cyclone as well as during summertime heat waves and also uh, unseasonal rain. So it is really unfolding many, you know, uh, challenges on the ground and uh, more than the what we so far understand about the co-location of hazard. Uh, how the risk is managed at ground level, as already said that farmers are also taking the adaptation on the ground in terms of seasonal, in terms of annual level, as well as long-term level. They do have some establishment of water irrigation methods at small scale level, and also adapting uh, multiple crops and other adaptation strategies. Um, on the other side, uh, the government is also running schemes. A uh, few of them already uh, shared in the beginning. Uh, crop insurance, one of main for farmers, as well as pension, uh, Yojana, as well as uh, PMJJBY, which is life insurance, also health insurance. Now, uh, the performance of this and how to, you know, what are the ground level issues that part of it already uh, uh, shared but on the other side it's recent uh, in this recent development is really helpful to managing the risk uh, farmers also you know slowly gradually understanding these un uncertainties and also you know taking some steps for example they also diversified their income while uh, young members also joined private jobs with uh, which provide uh, case income. So these things is also happening on the ground. Uh, in terms of AIDMI's experience, uh, AIDMI is one of agency which, you know, the, implemented first pilot in India related to disaster insurance. And uh, uh, we also time to time having the opportunity to conducting uh, impact evaluation and capacity building uh, activities. Uh, investment in insurance education is really very important uh, part. It is touched in the beginning, but uh, you know, this uh, understanding of insurance on the ground, we really need to invest more and without understanding the risk and insurance concept, it become really, you know, we see on the ground that it become for many small farmers uh, who have limited education and concept clarity, it become just a process with them. So they have enrolled in the insurance product, but why, what, and what is the change that is sometimes missing and it's really require investment in terms of education and being climate consciousness. Another one big point is co-design of insurance products. Yes, there are a few products, but we need not one, not one, but and also not universal, but many. And with involvement of, uh, you know, small farmers in design. Uh, another one point is there, there are huge number of women farmers and their their work in cotton farming is very high, but not in terms of complete farming cycle of cotton. And also, it's also about access uh, to training, access to credit, to market. These are really important angle to touch for, for performance of uh, our climate smart agriculture. So these are the few points uh, we would like to share uh, in a given time uh, looking forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishal. Bye. And now moving from, from that, I think it's a very nice lead into, into the, the, the world of insurance proper. And, and I'm going to invite Ayan Dev Saha, who is the lead climate risk insurance at KM Dastur and Company Limited. Uh, which specializes in precisely this type of, of issues to give us a Bit of a primer on what what does the what does the landscape for for insurance and particularly agricultural insurance look like in in India? There's there's lots of stuff going on there. I and Dev, why don't you share us some light on and some clarity on 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 these issues? 
Sure. No, thanks, Alandra. Nice to be here. Uh, I don't have any slides, but I can present some statistics and where the Indian agriculture insurance market is. Um, so first to start with, so Indian agriculture insurance has been the government's agenda since 1972 and 73. So that is where Indian first agriculture insurance scheme started. And then, of course, the scheme got modified and there are different versions came in. But the recent discussion that has always been uh, and has been the focus is PMFBY. And, and for the international, uh, you know, those who are not very used to the Indian market, you saw various schemes in the name of PMFBY, PMJJBY. So the word PM stands for prime minister. So most of the schemes are led by the prime minister's office. Um, with a very focused agenda uh, in terms of building resilience, not only of the farmers, but even in society in general. And that is the reason you see accident insurance, health insurance, life insurance uh, taking top priority. And in many of these schemes, there is a government subsidy, which I'll come to. Um, but in terms of agriculture insurance, currently Indian government supports two big programs. One is called as PMFBY, which is Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana. The Fasal word is crop. And then you have RWBCIS, which is Restructure Weather-Based Crop Insurance Scheme. Now, just again for the understanding purpose, the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, that is PMFBY, is more of a yield-based uh, crop insurance scheme, which is more linked to the production. And in terms of um, the RWBCIS is a more of a weather-based crop insurance scheme. So as a government, uh, they try to promote both a traditional um, yield-based, which is a more of um, multiple perils that gets covered under that scheme, uh, and also an innovative parametric-based insurance covers, which includes flood cover, drought cover for a specific agricultural value chain. What is important uh, in, in the scheme, in, in, the, in the context of agriculture insurance, Alandra, in the Indian context, it's very important to understand that agriculture is a state subject. So though the government, the national government, the federal government has an agriculture insurance scheme as an agenda, there is a separate body or a mechanism uh, which is managing the, the, the PMFBY scheme. But end of the day, the, the states um, decide on which um, crop to be insured and whether they want to participate in the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana. So in India, Sorry, there... I end up, and by state here, you're referring to the to a subnational level, right? Just to clarify. Good, I know you brought it. Yeah, it's like counties. It's like yeah, in Indian context, it's it's the state. Yeah, so it's a subnational level, right? And and the subnational level, the state governments decide which crops to be covered and which crops not to be covered, and also they decide whether they want to participate in the national scheme. If they participate, then there is a premium sharing happens. Uh, Indian scheme is highly subsidized. Uh, so it, roughly around 80% of the Indian agriculture insurance uh, scheme gets subsidized. How big is the entire premium when it comes? It is the third largest in the world with a 4 billion US dollar premium size every year. It is one of the largest scheme in the world when it comes to farmers enrollment. So 40 million farmers annually get enrolled in this program. And as I mentioned, out of this 4 billion, roughly around 80% comes as a government subsidy. But the subsidy mechanism, how it works in India, it is not by percentage, it's not a proportional sharing. The India government decides based on the season that how much farmer needs to pay as an insurance premium. So for Kharif season, it is 2% that the farmer pays. And for Ravi season, it is 1.5%. But the actual premium rate will be very different based on the location, based on the value chain that we are talking about. So the difference is actually paid by the government. Most of the state governments and the central government, except the northeast part of India, the premium gets shared in a 50-50 percent -50 basis. So that is how the structure of the program is. Um, and you are saying that there is a lot of talking on the scheme. So because of multiple reasons, one is, as I mentioned, a high enrollment. Uh, it's like 40 million farmers are joining a scheme, largest scheme of the world, $4 billion, um, the premium, and the scheme is growing. Um, if you ask me, in 23-24, the scheme grew almost close to 23% as compared to 22-23. Uh, now, while we see all these numbers, and of course, this growth has happened because few of the states who moved out of the scheme in, before 22-23 they all came back in the year 23, 24. So of course that resulted in a spike in terms of the premium contribution. Now I'm sure in this room and especially Seva around, so one of the things is how impactful the scheme has been. So currently, if we, if we take the data from 2014, 15 onwards, 
the average claims ratio is around 70% um, cumulatively. If we take some of the years like 2018, 19, and I'm sure in this room, many of us knows 18, 19 was bad, 19, 20 was bad. So in 18, 19, the overall claims ratio under PMFBY is 99%. So claims ratio is again, uh, when we say that how much amount has been paid to the farmers in terms of the premium earned. So, so in terms of impact, there has been, and of course, very recently, the government also under the schemes has adopted various technologies. I'm not going into health life, but as you heard uh, from the earlier presentations, there are also health and life insurance scheme. Uh, before I end, Alejandro, I think somewhere also in Emma's slides, it came out that there is a difference in terms of uh, awareness, understanding of agriculture insurance scheme amongst the farmers in Maharashtra and Gujarat. So first of all, the awareness is a challenge in the Indian context when it comes to agriculture insurance, because historically, agriculture insurance has always been embedded with agriculture finance. So, and this is again my thinking, the amount of education awareness that should have been happened at a scheme level has not happened to that extent, because a farmer goes and takes a loan, which is basically a farm input loan, and he gets insurance by default. So many times what happens, farmer doesn't see an agriculture insurance scheme as a standalone benefit. They more see it as embedded with agriculture finance. And top of their mind, the agriculture finance drives it. So, so that has been one. The second also, I saw there is some level of difference between Maharashtra and Gujarat. Now, Maharashtra and Gujarat also has, Gujarat is now currently not part of the PMFBY scheme. So again, it depends. Um, and at some point, Maharashtra has been and cotton insurance was part of the value chain. So again, it depends, as I said, um, and as you rightly mentioned also, so in India, it's a state matter. So sometimes you will see a difference of opinion uh, because the farmers are experiencing different um, schemes altogether. Um, and I also, I mentioned about Kharif and Rabi crop at a premium of two, 1.5. It's also equally important for us in this room to understand cotton, where does it sit in? Cotton sits as a commercial crop. So in terms of commercial crop, uh, if the scheme needs to come under PMFBY and farmer needs to get a benefit, the farmer's premium rate comes to 5%, right? Um, provided the state government uh, decides to include cotton um, as one of the notified crops under the national scheme. So, so this is in short, so yeah. That was great, and thank you very much. That's, that definitely brings some clarity. I'm going to hand now to Vaishali Bahel, who is with the Sustainable Cotton Program at Primark. And Vaishali, I think maybe the, the, the basic question is, why is this an important issue for Primark? Why, why, is, why is this knowledge in, important for Primark? And, and what can a company like Primark do to shape what is going on in this, in this sector? Thanks, Aliandro. Uh, a very pertinent question and you know uh, by listening to everyone and when we think about climate uh, shocks and the adaptation and mitigation strategies that one word that comes to the mind is interconnectedness you know we might be working from various corners of the world sitting in a cafe in our homes and home offices but we know that you know any one distress and it would have a cascading impact and that is how uh, you know, businesses uh, in the past many years have also realized that and they are not only focusing on the visible, you know, building structures as the key actors of the value chain, but have also uh, realized that the crit criticalities of the communities that are growing the raw material. So, um, you know, they have uh, many cases where um, women farmers and farmers are being are made the center of the business strategies. And I think in Primark also that has been a case and Primark started off his uh, cotton program in 2013 with that very base of you know, how to address uh, uh, the livelihood of farmers and uh, how to really source cotton uh, you know, better without with less uh, environmental impact. And uh, when we refer to the cotton value chain, uh, that one image that really um, crops up uh, is, of a spider's web, you know, where each of the thread, I mean, uh, to me would represent a different player, be it a farmer, dinner, business, suppliers, or even consumers. And the strength of the web uh, really relies on each thread being intact and connected. If even that one thread breaks, 
uh, such as a disaster hitting any farmer, it weakens the entire web. And there's the shift of tension, uh, you know, causing other threats to stretch and strain and possibly snap, which leads to major impacts and, you know, ripple effects across the chain. And uh, when we talk about this interconnectedness um, and if there's any kind of disruption, as I just talked about, uh, there are repercussions. And we are aware, I mean, in India, there is huge water scarcity at the moment. Heat wave has been intense. Uh, there, even if there's an excess, uh, you know, uh, rainfall, floods can wash away entire crops, homes, and uh, droughts can, you know, drive water supplies. And, you know, India, the water reservoir level right now is at 30%. So even cities are facing their shortages. I'm sure the farmland and the rural land is really uh, uh, facing more uh, issues as what, you know, uh, our, our other panelists also talked about. And these climate shocks and these covariate risks that we associate, you know, with economic struggles and food shortages uh, are affecting farming communities quite a bit. And it's, it's not only about economic losses, you know, they, it's impacting the health of the farmers. And that's where, when we talk about a supply chain, health of a farmer impacted or crop losses really results in, you know, delayed production, results in communities livelihood being impacted it disrupt disrupts the entire supply chain where you would have less yield you would have operational risk there are um, uh, increased costs uh, uh, other other insurance measures that have to be taken up there's decreased productivity because of uh, poor health and thus you know businesses in in the textile industry i feel are um, to remain strong have to uh, they require that each player in that value chain including including and most importantly the farmer are resilient and well supported and here when we talk about support it is about you know really helping the farmer to bounce back quickly after a disaster and with the aim you know our aim is to really reduce that lag between a disaster and the ability to bounce back and mitigate any future event uh, and this is where, when we talked about this insurance uh, work that we are doing with IID, uh, it is primarily with that intention that how can we help support this, um, this gap? How can we help sp support farmers further? We have already, uh, you know, with the program established in 2013, uh, supported uh, uh, in capacity building with, uh, uh, you know, training farmers along with Seva and Cotton Connect on um, sustainable farming practices, you know, various irrigation methods and pest management uh, with the aim of increasing productivity of farmers and thus the livelihood. Um, however, I mean, can we and how can we go forward? How we could help farmers recover swiftly from these losses is, is something that is totally driven by Prima core value, you know, of um, incorporating, encompassing the benefits for everyone. And uh, I think that's the major reason that Pramak uh, would really like to support because it's the strategy centered on farmers. So farmer is the core of the entire business strategy uh, of the entire program as well. So if we are able to support the key link, which is the starting point, I'm sure the entire cascading effect, the entire value chain gets, gets supported and is able to you know, quickly rebuild in case of, in case of any disaster and probably mitigate any future disaster as well. Uh, but the major requirement I think right now, and I would like to add is that, you know, all businesses, be it farmer associations or general association, we all have to proactively collaborate to support farmer resilience. We have to come together and be able to address all these issues because, you know, one or two companies, I mean, they themselves can't do everything. If you're able to come together, devise practical solutions to help farmers and uh, help them recover from disaster and enable them to prepare for future events, I think we would be able to go a long way. And uh, in the end, we all know small farm holders lack resources to cope with disasters and Primark has um, acted, I mean, as a convener and as a catalyst to bring together the right people and resources to support farmers in, um, building resilience against disasters.
Thank you very much, Vaishali. That was very insightful. Thanks. And then last but not least, let me introduce Charlie Longdale, who is the chair of Climate Risk and Resilience at Howden Insurance Group. And Charlie, let's zoom out of the specifics of India and cotton. And why don't you give us a bit of an overview of where the debate is at the, the, in the insurance sector about climate risk and how to handle it. And particularly, how do you get to smallholders like the ones in Gujarat that are experiencing very, very real needs? Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, um, Alejandro. And um, fascinating perspectives from all the panelists, really interesting, so thank you for that. Look, I mean, the fact is that um, the insurance market globally, still just under 50% of all insurance globally is purchased by people living in America. Okay, that, that so the 3.6 billion people who are at the climate front line, who are uninsured, are uh, our, our particular audience. So the market as a whole has a responsibility and an opportunity here that I think um, needs to be grasped. And I just want to, one thing I wanted to, to say, which I think um, might be pertinent to this. I mean, there's two, there's two, there's two things really. One is um, collaboration, which, um, you know, we were just hearing from Vajali just before. But also I just want to, if you don't mind, Alejandro, just to talk a little bit about um, what the what, what insurance does when the person knows that they have insurance. And I think this is um, a, a key issue here. We've, um, over the past sort of 18 months, we've been supporting a whole range of smallholder projects around the world from, from uh, you know, various different projects in Africa and in India and in the Philippines and in Latin America. And um, the research that we have, um, the, the, the data that we have received from these multiple projects, where, by the way, what we've been doing is we've been premium subsidizing some of those projects. The, 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 those projects where the farmers, uh, and all of these projects are parametric insurance, okay? So those, those projects where the farmers know that they own the insurance themselves, and that they trust that the insurance is going to going to work because it's an immediate parametric payment directly into their accounts. On average, especially on our African projects, we've seen a corresponding increase in yield. OK, so we have a project in Africa where it's we're sporting just under a million farmers. <clears throat> Actually, over the last two years, there hasn't been any claims. OK. Despite that we've seen a corresponding increase in yield. And the underlying reason for this, which puzzled us originally, was because the farmers who knew, know, they have, 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 um, have per know they have access to this insurance and they have bought it themselves with, with, with some premium subsidy, they tend to sow all of their seed. The farmers who do not have insurance have tended to keep some seed back in case of disaster. So when there, when, when, so in years when there is, um, when there is less drought, the yield of the entire community is increased. So what I'm saying here, um, insurance is, is um, in these situations is providing value um, it, to allow those individuals to invest in their futures, but only only if they know they have it. So one of the things that we've been um, trialing is, is this whole concept of gamification to try and provide um, uh, a, a chance for um, smallholder farmers. And actually, also, we have projects in uh, uh, for extreme heat in uh, urban workers in the informal um, informal work, uh, urban workers in India as well. And we found that as soon as you have adapted the way that you talk to communities about how insurance works, the 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 uh, take up of insurance massively increases. For example, we have one project which we've just completed in Ahmedabad in India with thirty thousand um, women urban workers in Ahmedabad. We there's a community there of thirty thousand women and twenty six thousand bought insurance for the first time. They they pay an equivalent of one dollar each for the insurance policy. We used to subsidize seven dollars. And it was the gamification process and the trust in that community, actually the trust in that community, which which encouraged um, them to purchase. So my, my piece on this, Alejandro, is the insurance market globally um, has a responsibility to collaborate and to help people understand what these these, these can do. And just to finish, just because I, I don't want to monopolize our time, uh, we at Howden, we've just launched a new uh, not-for-profit. It's called Humanity Insured. And it combines the firepower of 10 global insurance companies. Um, and the idea of that is to um, provide um, 
uh, um, education, modelling, and most importantly, premium subsidy, uh, the tune of um, about $20 million a year into this sector. And I think that um, this is not to try in any way compete with government um, schemes, but of course in India, especially with um, uh, the, the extremely important women's um, cooperatives, women's groups like Seva, we found that there are hundreds of millions of, of women um, farmers in the, in the agricultural sector who are just not in that marketplace. They do not have access to government schemes. They're not, they are, they're providing food and, uh, and, and um, finance for their families only. And those, it's that sector which we think uh, also could benefit from this, these types of products. Um, but anyway, we've, um, uh, this, this, what's wonderful about this particular session this morning is it, it sort of everything I've heard um, makes me feel very glad that we've, um, that we've, uh, we're putting something together to try and help address this in, in whatever way now. And just to go back to my, to this point about collaboration, um, I don't think any one company uh, on their own can have the sort of impact scale of this problem addresses. It requires an absolute combination of all the tools that we have globally in the box, as, as it were, i.e. government, multilaterals, a collaboration of corporates, the use of all the private sector tools as well. We need to use everything we can, otherwise we're not going to have uh, the, the impact that we require. And I just, um, maybe I'll just finish on that note, Alejandro, if that's okay. Sorry, I was I, I I lost the screen for a second. That's very that's great, Charlie. Thank you. In my extremely optimistic planning of this session, I was gonna have lots of time for questions and answers. But actually, it's very it's it's great because everybody has had a really really like meaningful intervention and and there's a lot on the table. I'm going to open it up for our audience to see if they have any questions that they want to raise and. Um, I don't think we can hear or see you, uh, but you can put your questions in the chat box on the Q or the Q and A box, which you have at the at the bottom of your screen. So, uh, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask uh, to our panelists or anything they'd like to add? We have just from looking at the at the list of participants, we see we have people from really like all over the place. Is there, any, are there anything you'd like to add to this discussion or anything you'd like to ask any of our panelists? And, and if you don't, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to maybe throw back to our panelists, if that's okay. Okay, I'll get started. If 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 anybody in our in our in our group feels inspired, please put it in the chat box and, and we can pick it up. I guess from what I've heard, there's there's maybe two or three really key things that that are that are coming up and I want to maybe throw them back to the group um so so I guess one main one is there's obviously and from Sewa's presentation it was very clear there's obviously a huge need there is an immense need for for not just insurance but coping mechanisms and mitigation mechanisms in general but we've also heard both from our study and from what Vishal and Ayan Dev and the others said, there's also the coverage is not great. How do we, what do we need to close that gap between the need and the coverage? What are some ideas? And maybe I won't go uh, one by one through the panelists because I don't think we have time, but if you just wanna like open up your microphone and maybe a very short kind of, you know, key priorities that we need to that we need to put on the table to close that gap uh, and i see charlie raising your hand go for it okay very simply um there's no point in modeling insurance products top down and issuing them to millions of people we need to understand from the people who are facing the problems themselves what the main issues are and then use them to model insurance back the other way and use immediate parametric measures, which people actually can trust, and word of mouth will spread th spread this. But let's do a bottom-up approach, not the old insurance approach of designing a model and hoping everyone buys it, is my, is my right. comment. Perfect, that's great. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, I am Dev. 
Yeah, uh, you see, uh, I think whenever we uh, bring this resilience discussion, I think the insurance comes up front, you know. But, you know, Alan, and, and what we have been doing in KMD is we are now trying to build a de-risking facility for the agriculture sector, irrespective of the food system. And I take the words which uh, Vaishali was rightly mentioning, it is integrating of all the actors into an ecosystem. So there is no point of giving an insurance if the farmer doesn't have access to inputs. There is no point of doing an insurance and giving access to finance if the farmer doesn't have a market. And when I say market, the right market, right price, you know, at which he is selling. So one of the things that we as KMD, we have been doing with various governments, especially in Africa, is setting up a de-risking and financing facility. We strongly believe insurance is one of the pillars, but insurance is not the only pillar to build resilience, right? Um, so I end there, right? So That's uh, a really nice point. Thank you. That's really great. Um, I have next uh, Vaishali. I think you were next. Yeah, thanks, Alejandro. So um, Mr. Saha has actually put in all the points that I really wanted to say, which was actually, you know, kind of integrating all the people in the chain and how one is related to the other and how can we package a deal for the farmers, understanding the farmer needs. I think that's the priority. And uh, and uh, also adding that, you know, how we reframe insurance for the farmers is also important. If they see it only as a financing or investment strategy and not as a hedging one, I think that kind of understanding and that kind of adoption would always be lacking. So the reframing of the insurance and I think probably educating them on that front, I think is also. That's perfect. Thank you. What a great number of of very clear uh, thoughts and priorities. Vishal. Thank you. Uh, as said, three points are very important from us. Uh, one is uh, we require more and more pilots and that needs to be connect with the local context. In the case of India, it is hilly areas, it is coastal region, it is flood plain, and this context needs to be incorporated into this. Again, wanted to say that insurance is not the only solution, not standalone measures also. Thank you. Can I give the last word? Is 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 Rajbi Ben with us? I think maybe they left. Unfortunately, our Sewa colleagues left, and I did want to give them the last word. So, but I think this is a really uh, yes. See, sorry, she conveyed. Um, uh, she is in Kutch and that's okay. I think we're at time, so I'm going to wrap, wrap it up for so, now. But I think this was a really okay, nice. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry. No, that's that's fine. That's right. That's why. Thank you, Vishal. I think this is a nice I should place to to stop. Uh, we're at time. Uh, just a really 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 interesting perspective. I'm going to like rehash what our panelists said as kind of like the top priorities. No point in top down initiatives. We need to build the products bottom up, co design. Second, we need to understand insurance as just a pillar, a part of a bigger ecosystem of things that need to happen finance, credit, inputs, other things. We need to integrate also different actors. Uh, Everybody has a small play to role. No one company can fix it. Lots of different types of actors need to be brought in. And Vishal, your point is very well taken. We need to, I think, if I can rephrase your point, experimentation. We need to experiment, pilot, see what works, see what doesn't, and then scale up from there. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, and not just for the like 10 minutes you were here, but from like the long discussions we've had in preparing for this and your amazing work preparing this report. So thank you to our partners. Thank you to our panelists. Emma, thank you for leading this research so well. Jose, Laura, Anne, and our comms team at IID who have been so very helpful. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to our audience for, for uh, sparing your time. And, and I think the last thing I wanted to say is in the spirit of collaboration and in the spirit of bringing people together on this topic, um, let's keep in touch. Reach out to us if you'd like to continue this work. We will email them the, um, 
the, the participants a summary of the meeting and our reports. So let's keep the conversation going. Thank you all very much and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye bye.